before I begin, there's two uh, uh, recent news events that uh, I find deeply disturbing, uh, both as an observer of American society, but I would say also, in one case, uh, personally as a journalist. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, a columnist for the Washington Post, who I worked with in the Middle East, uh, an incredibly courageous, honorable, um, perceptive journalist, was apparently murdered in the uh, Saudi consulate in Turkey, and probably it was probably in Ankara. Um, and uh, what I find so chilling, we also just lost uh, a Bulgarian investigative journalist who was murdered in a park, raped and murdered. Uh, and what I find so chilling is the uh, almost certain fact that the U.S. government will in no way uh, protest or sanction uh, the Saudi regime. Uh, I've long been a supporter of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement for Israel, uh, but I'm also a supporter of the boycott, <laughs> divestment, and sanction movement for Saudi Arabia. Um, the other, which I'm sure you've all followed, is the Kavanaugh hearings. What is so disturbing is the... exposure or the public exposure of the charade, the democratic charade that exists, the political theater that has replaced uh, our democratic process. Uh, and it's just one more step towards this corporate totalitarianism, which no one seems willing or able to stop within the ruling elite. Indeed, um, they are completely complicit. And the consequences are extremely dangerous. This book uh, was born out of the great uh, work on suicide by the a French sociologist, Emile Durkheim, who was published in 1897. I like Durkheim quite a bit. Uh, that, that was a, that kind of ferment. You had Durkheim, Max Weber, and Karl Marx, all roughly the same time period playing off of each other. Uh, but I like Durkheim for the same reason that I admire W.E.B. Du Bois, who, and I think you could argue that Du Bois was probably our greatest intellectual. Uh, because they married great scholarship and brilliance with this um, capacity to walk out into the communities that they were writing about and listen. So when, for instance, Du Bois writes his classic, The Philadelphia Negro, by the time he's finished, he's interviewed over 1,200 families in Philadelphia to profile what it's like at the turn of the century or the beginning of the 20th century for African Americans living in an urban setting. So Durkheim asks a question. And the question is, what is it that drives individuals and societies to engage in acts of self-annihilation? Uh, Freud would later ask the same question uh, in civilization and its discontents, uh, and Freud would frame it differently, but I think also helpfully, uh, where he said that at any moment in time, both within individuals and societies, uh, one of the primary forces uh, was ascendant. Eros, the capacity to nurture, protect, uh, and sustain life, and uh, the death instinct, post-Freudians later called it Thanatos, but the death instinct, that drive to annihilate every living system around you, including yourself. He writes this as Europe is devolving into uh, fascism and ultimately war. 
Uh, and Durkheim, when he writes his book on suicide, uh, he found that those communities and individuals who were least likely to engage in acts of self-destruction were those who had strong social bonds and provided space for individual self-expression and self-actualization. That was the greatest protection against collective or individual suicide. And those who carried out acts of self-destruction had essentially come from communities where those social bonds, the communal structure, the capacity for self-actualization had been destroyed. And he used the word anime to describe that state that propels people to engage in activities uh, of self-immolation. And it's interesting how you translate anime, literally, uh, means rulelessness, meaning, in essence, the rules that govern or, or the accepted rules of the social contract no longer function. So you work hard, you get a good education, you obey the law, you have the capacity uh, to sustain your community and make it flourish, and you have the capacity to fulfill yourself as an individual. When those contracts are broken, then you are thrust into a state of anomie, what sociologists call diseases of despair. And that's what I wanted to look at, the diseases of despair that afflict American society, the pathologies that rise out of a decayed culture, and when you examine uh, disintegrating cultures and civilization, these pathologies are always characteristic. So I studied classics uh, at Harvard and uh, was very familiar with the decline of the empire of ancient Greece and Rome, uh, and there uh, you saw at the latter part of those empires uh, characteristics that are intimately familiar to all of us within the American empire. So in essence, what happens, this is what Plato is lamenting when he writes the Republic, uh, because the re remember, Plato writes the Republic after the death of Athenian democracy. And he writes the uh, Republic the, the Greeks, of course, have a very different uh, notion of time, as do most Eastern cultures. They don't uh, see time as lineal. Uh, they don't believe in the, what, the myth of human progress, that we are just improving imp and improving. Rather, it's, it's time is cyclical, both for individuals and societies, so that you have a period of, uh, of maturation, of growth, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, you complete the cycle in, and it comes back to decay. So that's why when Plato is writing The Republic, it, it's all, every mechanism that he proposes is about trying to freeze time uh, because decay is inevitable, to stave off decay as much as possible. Um, so what kills the Athenian democracy is the rise of the Athenian empire because you need a central uh, bureaucratic structure to maintain empire, which is unelected and undemocratic, and um, the so the weakening of the polis of the city-states, um, and the, the that that construction of empire gives rise to an oligarchic class, which finally takes control. Um, you have less and less say within your society. Um, Thucydides writes about this when he says that the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself. Um, so what happens at the outer reaches of empire, we see it in our own empire, militarized police, wholesale surveillance, the uh, suspension or eradication of civil liberties, uh, militarized drones, all of those mechanisms that are first uh, carried out uh, against uh, those who are uh, being subjugated within 
empire eventually come back to the homeland because your military, as ours is, I mean, half of our discretionary spending is now spent on the military and our roads are crumbling and 16 million children go to bed every night hungry. And uh, you bring back those familiar forms of control uh, to the homeland. The other characteristic, of course, is that when that cabal seizes power, you had the ruling families uh, uh, in ancient Rome, they're just trading power back and forth, you have the facade of the republic, uh, it, it creates uh, a kind of licentiousness, um, there's essentially two rules. Matt Taibbi wrote a pretty good book about this called Divide, where he looked at the the legal mechanisms that criminalize the poor and the mechanisms that uh, essentially allow the elites, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, uh, to carry out massive acts of financial fraud and orchestrate tax boycotts, which they've done, uh, that there become two rules within the society. Um, as Barbara Ehrenreich pointed out in her great book, Nickel and Dimed, nobody works harder than the poor in this country. Um, and she describes being poor in this country as one long emergency. So the idea that working hard is somehow going to allow you to advance um, becomes a fiction. The other aspect of declining empire is that they, uh, they actually, at the beginning of empire, use their military prowess judiciously, fairly judiciously. But at the end of empire, as you begin decay, they engage, historians call it micro-militarism, they carry out uh, suicidal military fiascos. You saw the Soviet Union do this uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the Greeks, when they invaded Sicily, their entire fleet was sunk, most of their soldiers were killed, the empire disintegrates. You saw the, the, the British Empire in a slow decline after the end of World War I, then invades Egypt after Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal and uh, has to retreat in humiliation. And of course, what kills the power of the empire is the pound sterling is dropped as the world's reserve currency, which will kill our empire. Um, so essentially, it's mismanagement. Uh, you have elites that sever themselves from the rest of the country. They retreat into their version of the forbidden city or Versailles. Uh, there was a writer for the New Yorker who said, the rich in this country don't live in America, they live in Richistan. Uh, I think uh, Matt, Matt Taibbi called them stateless archipelagos, but that's right. And when you have an elite that is that divorced from the reality around them, and yet have that concentration of power and wealth, um, then you accelerate uh, the destruction uh, of the system itself because there's no rational governance. Uh, so what's happened in the United States is uh, a process that John Ralston Saul calls it the uh, coup d'etat in slow motion. I don't always credit him, but I was giving a talk in, uh, at the University of Toronto and, and suddenly noticed that he was seated in the front row. So, uh, <laughs> all writers are thieves, you know. Don't you know that joke about writers like, uh, you know, as John Ralston Saul said, the coup d'etat in slow motion, and then the second time it's, uh, well, as someone said, uh, the coup d'etat, and then the third time is, as I've always said. <laughs> but we had, I mean, you know, it turns out that Eisenhower, of all people, uh, was quite prophetic about where we were headed. Remember that the highest tax rates for the wealthiest individuals and corporations under the Eisenhower administration was 91%. I mean, people say, well, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to I say, tax them. We're going to tax them at 91%, like we used to. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is we must do uh, is destroy the military machine in this country, which is the greatest enemy of democracy.
There's no rational, was it yesterday, right? Was the 17th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan? I mean, this is our micro-militarism. The Taliban controls more territory in Afghanistan than when we went in. <laughs> they do. And we've lost the war. American troops, they don't even want to go out with the Afghan army because half of them are Taliban. I was with the PKK once in, uh, when I was covering the Middle East. This is the Kurdish uh, separatist group. And, uh, and I've, I've been with a lot of rebel or insurgencies, and I covered the war in El Salvador for five years, but I noticed not only were they well equipped, it's because they were all running drugs out of Lebanon, so they had money, <laughs> but they were really good. And uh, so I was talking to the PKK commander, and he said, oh, no, no, we won't accept anyone into it, the rebel movement until they've done their two years military service in the Turkish army. Um, <laughs> So what happened is that we lost control of, we lost control of our government, um, we lost control of our economy, um, you know, and this isn't unique to the United States. Uh, Neoliberalism as an ideology essentially created this absurd notion that societies uh, could advance themselves by kneeling before the dictates of the marketplace. This is popularized by figures like Thomas Friedman and others. Um, it's an absolutely ridiculous political theory. It has no economic validity um, in, in the, you know, I don't know how many years of economic history. Um, no society has benefited by allowing uh, their oligarchic elite to become unregulated and uncontrolled and unfettered, uh, but it's peddled, was peddled quite effectively uh, uh, by corporations beginning in the 1970s, reacting to the, uh, ari uh, uh, the rise of movements in the 1960s, what uh, the uh, political scientist Samuel Huntington called America's quote-unquote excess of democracy, uh, you had the Lewis Powell memo of 1971, which I'm sure you're aware of, which was the kind of blueprint that corporations used to uh, roll back these movements and seize control of all of the institutions, and this goes back to the Kavanaugh issue, including the courts, uh, uh, academia. So it, you, if you weren't, especially in economics departments or our greatest political philosopher who we lost a couple years ago, Sheldon Wolin, and read his book, Democracy Incorporated, a very important book for me in terms of giving me a language to describe the system. He describes the American system now as what he calls inverted totalitarianism. Uh, it's an important distinction from, uh, let's say, fascism, uh, because it's the primacy of economic profit over everything else, which isn't necessarily true in a fascist state. Um, and that, like the late Roman Republic, as I said earlier, you maintain the facade, the electoral politics. I mean, this ridiculous hearing they had with Kavanaugh as if everything wasn't preordained in advance. It, everything becomes tribal. Truth no longer matters. Uh, the rights of the citizenry no longer matter. But the structures are there. Still, you still pay fealty to the Constitution and stuff. And yet, inside the mechanisms of power, corporations control uh, everything. And, um, and so you saw, well, I remember speaking to Wolin, and I did a three hour interview with him, which is on YouTube, which is uh, right a year before he died, he was 92 or 93 then. Uh, and I, I had reread all his books, you can see I went in with legal pads full of notes, and there was, it's remarkable, I mean this guy, there was nothing I could uh, throw at him. Um, it, he hadn't been interviewed for over 10 years, and that was the last interview he gave. He was Cornell West's mentor. Cornell dedicated either his first or second book to Sheldon. Um, and, and Wolin, in the 1980s, was one of those who called out neoliberalism for the con that it is. And he was immediately blacklisted. He couldn't, he, he's a, quite a good writer, was quite a good writer. He used to write for the New York Review of Books. He was just purged. And he, he said that even at the end, within the political science department at Princeton, where he was teaching, uh, his own colleagues wouldn't speak to him. 
Um, so all of those figures who could have warned us, Ralph Nader is another one, were shunted aside. Noam Chomsky, our greatest intellectual, uh, hands down. I, I, a couple years ago, I got a call from Noam. I, of course, I re I've read Noam since, I don't know, I was 18 years old. Uh, and he said, oh, I want you to write, well, the, uh, I want to ask if you'll write the introduction to my new book. Uh, and so I hung up and I told my wife, I've arrived. That's it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, my whole understanding of the mechanisms of the liberal class, I wrote a book called The Liberal Class, Come Out of Chomsky. I actually told Noam I should have put you down there. Uh, you know, that whole idea of the liberal class not being the political left, that the liberal class functions as a kind of safety valve in moments of distress. And the reason in a capitalist democracy you tolerate the liberal class uh, is because they set the parameters of acceptable debate. And as soon as critics on the left start attacking the structures or the motives of the ruling elites, the liberal class discredits them and pushes them aside. The liberal class can critique the excesses, but they never critique the system. And you see the classic example of how a liberal class is supposed to function in a capitalist democracy uh, with the collapse of uh, capitalism in the 1930s and Roosevelt. And Roosevelt's, uh, he has, after, he, after his death, um, they published uh, his correspondence. I think his brother was the editor which I've read, and it's fascinating because Roosevelt is keenly aware of the powerful movements, uh, the Progressive Party, the labor unions like the CEO, uh, the uh, CIO, uh, but also the Communist Party, who we've kind of erased from our history, but it played an important role in American radicalism. Uh, and he says, if we don't respond, we'll get revolution and we'll lose everything. And so that's, it was that pressure that led Roosevelt, who came from the oligarchic elite, to say, well, if the private sector can't create jobs, then the government will create jobs. And he creates 12 million jobs. Um, Social Security. Uh, the, the unions in the wake of World War I had been decimated, destroyed, uh, and, and you know the old United Mine Workers couldn't even exist legally until Roosevelt reversed it. Um, so that's how a liberal class functions. And, and Roosevelt says his greatest achievement is that he saved democracy. I mean capitalism, not democracy. He saved capitalism. Uh, and, but, but what happened after the war and it, is there was an assault not only on those radical progressive movements that, as Howard Zinn has pointed out, opened up the space in our democracy. I mean, I always find it, uh, and of course, what, what, isn't today Columbus Day? Right. The, what? We should all, all be wearing black armbands. Uh, yeah. Do you know, uh, I was reading uh, Eugene O'Neill's biography, who was quite a radical, and he said the only, day that, the only day in American history that he really cared about celebrating was the day uh, the Sioux and the other... Uh, tribes uh, in the Little Bighorn wiped out the 7th Cavalry. That was really the only day he felt that. <laughs> so, as Zinn understood, the, the system was created as a closed system. Um, and you go back and read the Federalist Papers, and they were terrified of direct democracy. Of, and they created all sorts of mechanisms, including the Electoral College, which has given us the gift of George W. Bush and Donald Trump, uh, they created all sorts of mechanisms to thwart the ability of the populace, which they conf often conflated with the mob. So all of the spaces in American society were paid for with the blood of working men and women, African Americans, women in the suffragist movement, uh, throughout American history. And, and this is why Zinn's book, uh, is important. I, I teach in a prison, and uh, when you write up your proposal for your class, uh, it, I teach through Rutgers, and they say they get their BA program. I taught Les Miserables last semester, and I put in a proposal to teach Gulag Archipelago next semester. <laughs> I taught a class once called Conquest, 
and we read Open Veins of Latin America, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, which is a classic work on the Haitian uh, Revolution, uh, the only successful slave revolt in human history, uh, and Haiti's been paying for it ever since. Um, and I was in Montana. I'd given them the syllabus. I said, well, I won't be here this week because I have to speak in Montana. And I was in my hotel room in Montana, and I got a phone call, and it said, this is a special investigations division of the Department of Corrections of the state of New Jersey. Are you aware that your students just let a sit-down strike in the prison? <laughs> and it, it was very moving. I mean, I, I really was quite emotional when the phone call ended because they knew even better than I did what would happen. Uh, their cells would be strip searched as they were. They would all be interrogated until they found the leaders of the strike, which they did. And those leaders would be shipped to another prison and put in indefinite solitary confinement where they remain. And yet they rose up anyway. Uh, and we just, of course, saw heroic struggle on the part of incarcerated men and women, uh, which ended on September 9th, the anniversary of the 47th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising. Uh, if you haven't read Heather Thompson's Blood, uh, on the water, read it. It is a really amazing work of the history of the Attica uprising, but more importantly, how after that uprising, uh, the power elites effectively demonized African Americans, I mean, because they were so frightened. Um, so, uh, uh, when uh, that action that just finished on September 9th was concluded, um, you had seen throughout the country uh, thousands of men and women who had uh, carried out work stoppages. It didn't get the kind of press coverage it should, uh, commissary boycotts and hunger strikes, um, because they grasped, I, and I think it's an important lesson for all of us, that our system is so calcified that reform will not come from within. It will only come from without. And as the Free Alabama, uh, the, I don't know if you know about the Free Alabama movement, they did a work stoppage 2010, and then they put the leaders again in indefinite, indefinite solitary confinement. Uh, but Alabama being Alabama, uh, where the guards make minimum wage, it means you can get anything. So I'm, well, they call me on their cell phones all the time, which you're not supposed to have. But they said, you know, the only way to end slavery, which is neo-slavery, which it is in our prisons, is to stop being a slave. That we, the only mechanism we have now is to break them economically. If you paid uh, prisoners the minimum wage, our entire prison system would collapse. It's not, it can't be sustained. Uh, prisoners in Louisiana make four cents an hour. Uh, I guess if you're really at the high end, you can fight fires in California for a dollar an hour. Uh, New Jersey, they make 22 cents an hour. That's $28 a month. Um, I've got students who, you know, spend 20, 30, 40 years in prison, work 40-hour weeks, get out, and not only do they not have Social Security, they're in debt. It was now you, you get in debt in prison. Um, so I, I think that on, you know, though, people who come out of marginal communities, I certainly find my students in the prison have a kind of hyper-awareness of... Uh, the fact that we live in a failed democracy, that our democracy is not a functioning democracy, and that by appealing to those institutions, uh, and this was my, both mine and Shama Sawant's problem with Sanders, we, we did an event with Bernie and Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein uh, the night before the climate march in New York, and Shama kept pushing Bernie not to run as a Democrat. Uh, and I found Bernie's answer quite uh, illuminating because he said, well, if I do that, I'll end up like Ralph Nader. And he's not wrong. What he was saying is that if I defy the Democratic Party establishment, they will destroy me. And the tragedy for me of the Sanders campaign is one, as ter which turned out to be true, I never believed that the Democratic Party was going to ever permit Bernie to get the nomination, and I think we now have enough cumulative evidence to say that it was stolen from him. And secondly, we're never going to build a resistance movement within 
the span of an election cycle. Um, and we're going to have to walk out into the wilderness for a long time. Um, Ceresa, which governs Greece, and yes, I know about Cyprus caving into the banks, but Ceresa was polling at 4% 10 years ago. Um, we're going to have to go back and do that hard kind of work. Um, I, I, uh, I managed, I was going to tell that Zen story, so I, I, one of my great coups in the prison, so I, when, I, when I write the uh, description of the course, it's, uh, the purpose is, it's the op opposite from writing for a college audience where, you know, class on the lawn, lots of films. Um, uh, You've got to make it sound absolutely as boring and turgid as possible. So I submitted a proposal to teach American history and the three branches of government, uh, and Constitution, which got passed, because it goes through Rutgers, then it goes through the prison administration, and then I brought in uh, the people's history of the United States for all of my students. <laughs> uh, it was quite moving. I mean, they, most all of them are black. And, and Zinn is quite cognizant throughout that whole book of the, the, the story of African Americans. And these guys, were, their minds were blown away. But I would be giving my 90-minute talk on whatever chapter we were on, Reconstruction or something, and I would hear students go, damn, we've been lied to. <laughs> and they have. They have been lied to. So we saw that period in the 70s where corporations organized a frontal assault against every institution that made democratic space possible, that made the mechanisms of reform possible, that gave a voice to the citizenry and critics of imperialism, critics of capitalism, and it closed and closed and closed. At the same time that the economy was reconfigured and we shifted, in the words of the Harvard historian Charles Mayer, from what he called an empire of production to an empire of consumption meaning that we were borrowing to maintain both an empire and a lifestyle we could no longer afford. I don't know if you saw the New York Times story a few days ago on uh, the explosion of government debt, of the U.S. debt. It was quite, it was quite chilling. It was a front-page story. And it was, uh, of course, with the tax cuts, uh, over a 10-year period, we will diminish an estimated $1.5 trillion from government revenue. Um, next year, we're on track to pay uh, about $370 billion of interest. And in 10 years, we will be paying $900 billion a year in interest. It's not a sustainable system. Um, but, of course, there is a handful of people on Wall Street and in criminal organizations like Goldman Sachs who are doing extremely well. Um, I, uh, I've taught three times at Princeton uh, and uh, I remember when they had a small Occupy gathering at Princeton and they asked me to come speak to them and uh, I did. What I didn't know is that there was a reporter from the Daily Princetonian in the crowd uh, and the next day the school paper said Ferris Professor announces, yeah, I was quoted correctly, Ferris Professor announces that uh, uh, the president of Princeton and other elite universities are just overcompensated fundraisers. Uh, <laughs> Princeton students are far too deferential to authority and half of the Princeton trustee board should be in prison. <laughs> I, I wasn't invited back next year. I actually got an email that day. I think they they wanted it clear that they'd read the story. Um, but of course it's true. I mean, Princeton is just a corporation, uh, like most of these universities. Uh, you know, Harvard, the same. They, they produce systems managers. The largest major at both Harvard and Princeton is computer science. Um, uh, the humanities are withering away. All of those mechanisms that teach us not what to think, but how to think. I mean, they're not wrong that an education is subversive. Uh, it, it's designed to make you ask questions. Uh, but the system uh, only wants people who will perpetuate it. So you get the 2008 financial crash, and 
the systems managers loot the U.S. Treasury to reinflate a failed financial system. The University of Missouri just recently uh, did from, you know, went and looked and tried to estimate the exact amount of money the Fed had fabricated, uh, and they came up with $26 trillion. Trillion dollars. I mean, imagine. Now, China's response to 2008 was very different from our own. It was about kind of like the New Deal. They had infrastructure projects and all, put people to work. $26 trillion were handed to people who should be in prison, unlike my students. And, uh, uh, and what did they do with it? Well, they, as they've done with the, the tax cuts, they bought back their own stock. And, you know, this idea that an overheated stock market is good for the economy, I just want to give everybody copies of uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's The Crash. Um, it, it's insane. Uh, it's not tied to value. Of course, they're over buying back their own stock. Apple bought back 100, I think I have that right, 100 million of their own stock, something like that, because the, all the CEO's compensation packages are tied to it. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're even cheating their own stockholders, ultimately. Um, and uh, so what do they do with the money? They hoard it. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's borrowed money, they're, but it's borrowed at virtually 0% interest, and central banks in Europe were lending money out at negative interest rates, which meant they actually gave you, if you borrowed money, they give you money. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what did they do with the money? They, they bought back their own stock, which swelled their compensation packages, they hoarded it, or they gambled. Uh, for instance, um, and there was another article in the Times. I read other papers besides the Times, but uh, there was an article in the Times in the Week in Review about two or three weeks ago where they talked about the fracking industry being the next dot-com bubble because the fracking industry is a lo loses money. It, it's, it's, it's valued on projected profit, just like the dot-com industry, not actual profit. They've already swallowed about $280 billion. Um, so what you've done is there, there's no use of that money, which of course, I mean, the tragedy is that, you know, every student in this country could go to college for free. We would have a rational healthcare system uh, where we weren't preyed upon by pharmaceutical and insurance companies, 18% of GDP, the least efficient health care service in the industrialized world. Uh, and even if you have insurance, you're costs and co-pays and, you know, everything is imploding because they can. Uh, you know, a million people a year go bankrupt uh, uh, because corporations have the ability to hold their sick children hostage while they try and, while they bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons or daughter. I mean, it's an utterly insane system. Um, all of this could have been fixed, but it wasn't. And... Of course, the problem is that it has to be paid back. And so what they are doing is extracting from us. That's student debt, $1.5 trillion, and it's estimated that within two decades or so, 40% of those who have student debt will go into default. Uh, personal debt is uh, $13 billion. I mean, American production since 1973 has gone up by 77%. And, and if wages had kept pace with production, the minimum wage would be well over $20 an hour. Uh, 41 million workers in this country, a third of the workforce, earn less than $12 an hour, and almost none of them have employee-sponsored health insurance. But that's by design, because they need to suppress wages in order to extract debt. And I opened the book in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the moment the city faces, is facing insolvency. So, Everyone in the city uh, has been put on minimum wage, including the mayor. Uh, what happened, their pension funds were decimated in 2008, uh, lost 40% of their value uh, because of financial fraud, and uh, they're selling off their city assets. They're selling off their sewer system, their parking authority, um, all of their utilities, in a desperate effort to uh, regain financial solvency. Uh, and, of course, these corporations come in and then jack up the prices. Uh, double, triple the prices. And the per capita income in Scranton is $45,000 a year. But the question is, 
what happens when they don't have any assets to sell off? And this is described quite effectively by Marx when he writes about the, the latter, the late stage of capitalism. He said when, and Karl Polanyi is uh, the other writer that captured this in his book, The Great Transformation, that when you have unfettered, unregulated capitalism, corporate capitalism, that it, is, it has the capacity to commodify everything. Human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity, that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And that's, of course, what we're seeing in this insane inability to respond to the eco side. You've all seen the report that came out yesterday, which says basically we have 10 years to save ourselves as a species. That's it. And the reason that climate scientists are so terrified, they're talking about 1.5 Celsius, the reason they're so terrified of going beyond two degrees Celsius is because of feedback loops, which means that essentially you lose the ability to control. So you, your, your temperatures rise, your ice cap, the polar ice caps melt, and once they're gone, they're not coming back for thousands of years. Uh, the uh, acidification in the oceans, I mean, that you can't control it, that one plays off of the other. And we know what feedback loops do, because they've studied it on planets like Venus, which used to have water and is now 800 degrees. That's where we're headed. But we've retreated into what anthropologists would call crisis cults, magical thinking. So the seizure of power by these elites, the primacy of profit, the destruction of uh, democratic institutions, including the courts, really, and you are going to watch now with Kavanaugh some very, the, the, what they do, what they've been doing, but it will be accelerated, is they are taking from us our constitutional rights by judicial fiat, i.e. reinterpreting the right of unlimited corporate power through a distorted interpretation of the Constitution. How do they justify Citizens United? It's the right to petition the government. I'm not making this up. It's the right for free speech. What do they do when, they, when Edward Snowden provides concrete proof that our right to privacy has been taken from us? Nothing. I mean, I love it when they all talk about how they're strict constitutionalists. And, <laughs> you know, I wrote, when I wrote that book on the Christian right, uh, it was fascinating because I was always very upfront about who I was and where I came from. I, my father was a minister. My mother was a seminary graduate. She was a professor. I graduated from seminary. And as soon as the history was there, they never wanted to speak about the Bible with me, ever. <laughs> because they don't know the Bible. They're selective literalists, just like our strict constitutionalists. They select certain pass biblical passages that affirm their ideology. And they have acculturated the worst aspects of American imperialism and American capitalism into the Christian religion, sacralized it. And I blame the liberal church that we didn't call these people out for who they are, which is Christian heretics. You don't have to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School, as I did, to understand that Jesus didn't come to make us rich. <laughs> and the Christian right played an important part in this destruction with deindustrialization, slashing of social service programs, all of it, much of it pinned on Clinton. Uh, NAFTA, of course, but the destruction of the old welfare system and 70% of the original recipients in our welfare system were children. The deregulation of the FCC, which has allowed five or six corporations to seize control of the airwaves. What about 90% of most Americans watch and listen to. Ripping down the firewalls between investment and commercial banks, which precipitated the global crisis. That was all Clinton. And Clinton did corporate bidding. By the 90s, the Democratic Party had fundraising parity with the Republicans. And when Barack Obama ran in 2008, he got more. But that created the faux liberal class, a fake liberal class. There used to be a liberal wing of the Democratic Party, but it's long gone. And so you have people who continue to speak in that feel your pain language, but are, have sold out working men and women. 
And that's where a lot of this white rage comes from in the white working class. Uh, Baldwin, James Baldwin, who I love, and I don't really think you can understand America if you haven't read Baldwin, uh, but he writes about why is it that white working men have, are susceptible to a midlife crisis in a way black men are not. And he says it's because when you're black, you realize that the game is fixed. <laughs> Whereas if you're white, you're more susceptible to believe the myth of a meritocracy and you get ahead and then you wake up and realize it's fixed. <laughs> and that's what's happened. And so it is that sense of enti white entitlement colliding with economic and political reality that they don't matter. And Trump, of course, fed upon that. Uh, the whole idea that Trump was elected because of Comey or the Podesta emails or Russian bots is frightening because it is a way of refusing to address the massive social inequality that has distorted our system. You can't maintain a democracy in an oligarchy. Aristotle knew it. I mean, Aristotle said, once you have an oligarchy, your choice is between tyranny or revolution. And um, the longer the Democratic Party, I mean, they're playing a very dangerous game now because they are, they, they're following the same tactic Hillary Clinton followed, which is Trump is, and we know from the Podesta emails that they wanted Trump as the nominee. And so the tactic is Trump is so repugnant, Trump will implode, but now you've watched with the Kavanaugh hearings. I mean, look, I certainly hope the Democrats retake the House. <coughs> Uh, just as any kind of a block, obviously. Uh, but they're, they're playing a very dangerous game by refusing to address the fundamental issues uh, that have distorted our society. And of course, they're creations of the corporate state. Pelosi and Schumer in particular, their job is to funnel Wall Street and corporate money to anointed Democratic candidates. Um, they have certainly purged the Bernie people from the party. I know Bernie's going to run again. It is, as uh, Samuel Johnson said, the triumph of hope over experience. Um, <laughs> these people, if we had real electoral reform and we remove corporate money from the Democratic Party, they wouldn't have power. And I think how it, I, they're certainly cognizant of how fragile things are, but they're just not about to give up their first class accommodations, no matter what. Uh, but we could all go down because of that. And I, I really look at the Democratic Party like any failed liberal elite as deeply complicit in the rising totalitarianism that is uh, emergent around us. Uh, so these corporate forces in the name of the primacy of profit destroyed our democracy, distorted our economic system into an oligarchy, rewrote our laws and regulations uh, so that they can carry out an ecocide uh, for short-term profit. Uh, and that seizure of power by a corporate cabal replicated the seizure of power by any cabal, monarchical, communist, fascist, um, in that it created political paralysis. It created uh, the inability of the government to respond in a rational way to the rights, desires, needs of the majority of the citizenry. Uh, and, and, and at that moment of political paralysis, something I watched in Yugoslavia, plus severe economic mismanagement. It's a very frightening recipe because it's fertile ground for demagogues. And I want to go back to the Christian right because we talk about magical thinking, fake news, and all this stuff. Um, there are long antecedents for the, the arrival of a monstrosity like Donald Trump. Uh, and they come largely out of the Christian right uh, because there you have uh, people who have retreated into the embrace of magical thinking I, and I spent two years writing a book on them, American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War in America. It was my way of trying to reach out to them. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't hear their stories without being moved. I mean, they do, the, the suffering that they endure is real. Uh, uh, not just economic, but you know, all of the attendant problems that come with the rupture of social bonds sexual, domestic abuse, struggles with addictions, jail time, chronic underemployment, unemployment, all that. And so finally they, they couldn't take it and they retreated into the embrace of magic Jesus. And who, you know, people say, how can the Christian right be supportive of Trump? And I said, no, no, you, don't, you have it completely wrong. Trump 
is absolutely characteristic of the figures who lead the Christian right. Um, look, I've been in a room with some of them. The J Jan and Paul Crouch, I went to their studios. Dobson, who is as frightening and evil as he looks. Uh, <laughs> They preyed on people's despair, and they've become very wealthy because of it. They prey on that despair in the same way that Trump preyed on the despair of people who went into his casinos. I write my chapter on gambling out of the Trump Taj Mahal uh, before Trump announced, so it was completely... Uh, and the place has gone through, when I got there, gone through several bankruptcies. Most of the rooms were mothballed. Most of the restaurants were closed. The arena was closed. You could, after you waited long enough, you could watch rodents literally run across the floor. The big mole spots, the lights burned out. Kind of a metaphor for where Trump's going to take us. Um, <laughs> but the, they, the, 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 you can't be questioned. They're, they're utterly narcissistic. These, they're narcissists, these mega pastors, almost all of whom are white men. Um, and you're not going to rationally argue these people out of their world view. And that was driven home to me when I went to Detroit. I was with Tim LaHaye in the End Time series, and it was a weekend on uh, the wonders of the uh, apocalypse uh, and the Antichrist. And it was really quite remarkable because none of it was biblical. It was painted as biblical. I mean, the rapture is not in the Bible. Uh, but it was all like, you know, the non-believers, blood will boil. I'm not making this up. And their eyes pop out and all this gruesome stuff. And I realized then that the, the, the exhilaration that they felt in that room for uh, the end times was the exhilaration of being able to destroy a world that almost destroyed them. And I came to the conclusion at the end of that book that the only way to save ourselves from this Christianized fascism, uh, and remember the Nazis had the German Christian church, don't forget, with the swastika on one side of the altar and the Christian cross on the other, uh, is to reintegrate these people into the economy. Short of that, you can't argue them out of believing that, uh, you know, Every living being, including the dinosaurs, was created in six days because the book of Genesis says it's so. I was in the Creationist Museum in Peterborough, Kentucky, uh, which is kind of an amazing with huge lots for the school buses. And the first, uh, and they, they brought in the people who did Universal Studios. So, so you go in for the, the replication of the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and a little waterfall, and the T-Rex with a saddle on it. Uh, and I'm making it up. And when I'm going through with a guide, and she says, well, I'm sure you all wonder why T-Rex had such big teeth. That's because Adam and Eve used T-Rex to open the coconuts. <laughs> and we go, go to the next room, and it's a replica of Noah's Ark, and she goes, I know you all want to know how Noah got the dinosaurs on the ark. He only put baby dinosaurs on the ark. You know, it's all kind of funny here, but when you're in a room with 50 or 60 people who believe it, it's truly terrifying. It's truly terrifying. And Trump came out of this, and he has no ideology. He's the classic, uh, you know, he's the classic con artist that rises up out of decayed state. I saw it in Yugoslavia, Radovan Karadzic, Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, Franjo Tuzman. Uh, and of course, what he, that ideological void is now being rapidly filled by the Christian fascist ideology. Um, Noam Chomsky says, probably correctly, we may get rid of Trump, but Pence is worse. And the drive to put Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court came from the Christian right. I mean, Susan Collins, sitting around pretending she doesn't know that this guy is going to reverse Roe v. Wade, is really hypocritical. I mean, it, they put millions of, the Christian right made it very clear to the Republican Party this guy had to get on for that reason. Um, so what happens? Well, Trump has catapulted us uh, into a whole nother phase of decay. One, by engaging in the crude and vulgar trash talk which degrades political discourse. Look, you saw it 
replicated in the Kavanaugh hearings, both by Grassley and Kavanaugh himself. Um, so there's a decay of civil discourse, which is classic to totalitarian. It's reduced to insults, hyper-masculinity, misogyny, all this kind of stuff. But there's also the embrace of what Hannah Arendt called the permanent lie. So all, as I have Stone said, all governments lie, all politicians lie. Bill Clinton lied when he, he conned us into NAFTA, uh, saying it would create lot, millions of good middle class jobs. Uh, George W. Bush lied when he said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. But they don't still, George Bush still doesn't tell us their weapons. Clinton doesn't now say that it created lots of millions of good middle class jobs. The permanent lie is impervious to reality. And that's what Trump, that comes out of the Christian right, and that's Trump. So you can have photographs of Barack Obama's inauguration crowd and, and, and Trump's inauguration crowd, and it doesn't matter, his is bigger. And Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism writes that, that the embrace of the permanent lie, which is always a feature of totalitarian states, uh, creates a kind of collective schizophrenia because you see reality or verifiable fact in front of you and yet it's denied, it's denied, it's denied, it's denied. So what I fear is that our economic system is not sustainable. And I have lived through economic meltdowns I covered in the 20 years I was a foreign correspondent to disintegrating societies. I know what the warning signs look like. Um, and once that stability is eradicated, and I don't know what's going to trigger it, whether it will be another financial collapse, or as Alfred McCoy points out in the shadows of American century, the day the dollar is dropped as the world's reserve currency. You know, if you read the New York Times stories closely, because they say, but the dollar is the world's reserve currency. But I'm going to stay that way. McCoy said by 2030 it's finished. And at that moment, everything implodes. You can't maintain your empire. Imports become expensive, chronic underemployment, unemployment. The elites have no plan B because they can't lower interest rates any more than they've lowered them. And at that point, you have created fertile ground for the kind of scapegoating, demonizing, and violence. And we already have a president who speaks in, the, incites violence rhetorically. You've created fertile ground for the rise of an American fascism. And our only response now is sustained mass acts of civil disobedience. That's it. And the state will be vicious. I was at Standing Rock. But Standing Rock's the model. It's got to have a spiritual dimension in the way Standing Rock had one. It's got to understand that what we're fighting for is the systems of life, is the sacred, is the understanding that there are people and things around us that have an intrinsic value beyond a monetary value. And when we are effective, when we are effective, as we saw with Standing Rock, they will throw everything at us. Remember, Standing Rock was under Obama. 700 arrests, a nonviolent protest attack dogs unleashed on the crowds, water cannons laced with pepper spray, unleashed, fired, or hosing down the protesters in sub-zero temperatures, constant infiltration, constant drones. When I drove in in November, I, I had to come all the way around because the roads were blocked, but when I was stopped, these weren't law enforcement, they were dapple mercenaries in Kevlar vests with long barrel weapons with no identification. We have no time left, just from climate change. We have no time left. And in that sense, 
resistance becomes a moral imperative. We have to stop being constrained by the tyranny of the practical. We have to understand, as Daniel Berrigan once told me, I asked him, how do you define faith? And he said, the belief that the good draws to it the good, even if empirically everything around you says otherwise. I have kids. We may fail, but at least I want my kids to say he tried. I'm not going to be complicit. I'm not going to be passive. And I can tell you that the good does draw to it the good. Those ironic points of light that flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I compose like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. I who covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe. And the revolution is what I'm calling for. And I'll spell that for the homeland security. <laughs> I'm not playing the games anymore. We don't have time. I'm calling for the overthrow of the corporate state. And we will overthrow it just as the regimes in Eastern Europe were overthrown, through nonviolence and through essentially carrying out sustained acts of mass civil disobedience, acts of conscience, because no revolution succeeds as the writers of revolutionary theory, Crane, Britton, Davies, and others have noted, unless a certain segment of the ruling apparatus defects. Then they're finished. So it's 1989, I was there. Honecker, the communist dictator in East Germany, sends down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig to crush the demonstrations. They get there, the local communist authorities refuse to deploy them, Honecker's out of power in a week. Same thing with the Russian Revolution. They send the Cossacks in to crush the rioters in Petrograd. They refuse. The Tsar is gone. He doesn't even make it back. He has to abdicate on a, in a railway carriage. That's how it works. The good draws to it the good. And nobody knows how rotten, corrupt, and decayed this system is better than the people who manage it. I was in Prague. It was every evening in the Magic Lantern Theater with Václav Havel during the Velvet Revolution. You had posters all throughout the city of Jan Pollock, a Charles University student who, to protest the Soviet invasion in 1968, went to Wenceslas Square, lit himself on fire. Four days later, he died of his burns. His funeral, which was not reported by state media, was broken up by police. When his grave became a shrine, his body was exhumed. His, his remains were cremated, and his mother was not allowed to rebury them. A week after the communist government fell, 10,000 Czechs marched to Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was in Wenzelau Square with half a million Czechs. In December of 89, it was snowing. So the great Czech singer Marta Kubasheva comes out on the balcony. Now, she had sung in 1968 a prayer for Marta to protest the Soviet invasion, the overthrow of Dubček, and the installation of a pro-Soviet regime. Once the Soviets took power, they destroyed her recording stock. She was banned from the airwaves. And in the intervening years, she worked on an assembly line in a toy factory. And when she walked out on that balcony and began to sing a prayer for Marta, every Czech in the crowd knew every word. That is the good drawing to it, the good. But if we don't stand up, it can't be seen, and we can't use the word hope. I don't know if we will win. I don't even know if we will survive as a species. But these corporate forces have us by the throat, and they have my children by the throat. And in the end, I don't fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. Thank you.
So block those rail carriages carrying bitumen tar sands. That's your job. Yeah. Over here. Thank you. Chris, on the heels of that, uh, this all feels a little bit small ball, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ramp up. But um, as someone who has been green or third party since 1996, I've watched the Democratic Party march steadily right my entire life. While I admire the attempt to change the Democratic Party, presumably from within, I feel this effort traps progressives and actually prevents change. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I fully agree. You know, I was, I was Nader's speechwriter. Uh, and Ralph, I think, understood. Nobody understands corporate power better in America than Ralph Nader. None. And nobody has fought it with more integrity. And let's get over the democratic lie that he elected George W. Bush, because it's not true. Uh, Ralph understood because he saw that process. He was up close. I mean, as Ralph said, the, our last liberal president was Richard Nixon. <laughs> not because he was a liberal or had a conscience, or, but because he was frightened of movements. So he passes, I think, 24 pieces of amazing legislation. He creates OSHA, the Mine and Safety Act, the Clean Water, all of which were written by Nader and then funneled in through what the existent liberal wing of the Democratic Party. Black lung. That came under Nixon. And we lost those movements. I mean, people say, you know, elections, you know, as Emma Goldman, if elections were that effective, they'd be illegal. Uh, <laughs> even if Sanders had won, he would have been paralyzed in Washington. We have to rebuild those movements. The job is to pit power against power. And I've told it before, but there's a moment in Kissinger's memoirs, although you are all banned from buying the book, where uh, it, it's 1971 and Nixon has taken empty city buses around the White House, uh, there are tens of thousands of anti-war demonstrators, and Nixon is looking out the window going, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that's where we want people in power to be. <laughs> it's our job to put them there. Uh, <laughs> and of course, they're destroying the remnants of unions as fast as they can with the new right-to-work laws, and you can be sure now, the Supreme Court. I mean, the, the whole perverted idea that individual choice or uh, gender identity or something, it's all conflated with freedom. And that kind of hyper-individualism, and of course I, I support everybody to actualize themselves a as who they were meant to be, but that, that is essentially what we are given in place of freedom. The only way we're going to protect ourselves is to rebuild the communal structures, the social bonds that allow us to resist. And part of, you know, what's so depressing is the press. I mean, CNN is just endless burlesque. Watch it. It's, it's pattern. Zucker patterns it, he's admitted this, quite consciously on ESPN. It's just endless chatter, speculation, who's in, who's out. They're all courtiers. It's all reality television. They just finished the Kavanaugh reality television series as if there was any doubt about the outcome. And then we had the Stormy Daniels television series and the Omarosa television series. But it's not news, it's not journalism. It makes them a lot of money. I mean, they are complicit in creating Trump. And they love Trump. Trump's a money maker for them. Uh, so we've got to rebuild those movements. And, and they have done a pretty good job of decimating the mechanisms by which we once protected ourselves from their predatory nature. And I think part of that is third party. So Ralph said, look, we won't win, but if we can get 5, 10, 15 million votes, we can begin to create pressure and hopefully get the Democratic Party to respond. And the Democratic Party did respond. After 2000, Nader scared the hell out of them. And uh, they responded by demonizing him and the corporate media went along with it. Uh, they challenged his voting list, running up millions of dollars in, uh, I mean his voting lists were uh, impeccable, but they just wanted to run up his legal bills. So Patty Smith and I were running around raising money for Ralph. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've got to, you know, we've got to begin to hold fast to what we believe. People say, well how, you know, 
I mean, for me, it's personal. I mean, I worked in Gaza. I can't, I'm not going to betray the Palestinians. I mean, if Barack Obama gets up and gives a speech written by AIPAC, I'm not betraying these people. Everybody else betrays them. I'm not betraying them. I, my students, half of my students wouldn't even be in prison but for Bill Clinton. You know, half of the people in our prison system are not charged with ever physically harming another person? It's social control, and corporations are going in there making a killing. Global Telling, Aramark, you know, every service. It's a billion, and their lobbyists are all down there making sure those recidivism rates of 76% within five years remain just where they are. Go ahead. Actually. Oh. No, no problem. Uh, so then, to follow on, uh, does it matter who runs for president in 2020? And if so, who should run for president in 2020? I just don't waste a lot of time. Or, I mean, I voted for Sanders in the primary. I voted for Jill Stein in the general election. I mean, we, you know, I gave a talk in, uh, when, once when Nader was running in uh, Dearborn, which has the largest concentration of Arab Americans, and I kind of gave it to them, because they, they have resources, highly educated. On, and I said, you know, you all, you've got arguably the most important, because you know Ralph is of Lebanese descent, he speaks fluent Arabic. I said, you have the most important Arab American in the, you know, the modern period. And I said, you know, you've got, he's saying everything right about Israel, about Palestine, and you've got to stand behind him. And I said, you know, if I was speaking to a Jewish group and, and, and Israel, it was reversed, they wouldn't walk out. We have to, if we don't begin to hold fast to those moral imperatives, they're going to continue to do what they've always done, which is steamroll, steamroll us. Um, you know, I just don't know how, many, how much more evidence anybody wants that the system doesn't work. I just, I'm just kind of mind boggled. Uh, uh, and, and the Democratic Party has been completely complicit in all of this and their stubborn refusal to address the social inequality that is destroying the country. And they don't want to address it, number one, because they're complicit, and number two, because if there was real reform, they'd be out of a job. That's right. Well, no, they'd be hired as lobbyists, but <laughs> this is where most of them end up anyway. Um, switching over to a couple of questions about the media. Um, your show On Contact is on RT America. That network is seen as a tool by some used by the Russian government to send misinformation to the American people. How do you respond? Well, don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to know why they, don't, they want to shut down RT America or shows like mine? Read the Director of National Intelligence report. There's seven pages on RT. There's not a word about Russian propaganda. They're quite transparent. They interview anti-fracking activists. They interview Black Lives Matter activists. If, you are, if we had a functioning public broadcasting system, I wouldn't be on RT. <laughs> Look, I mean, they'll shut me down eventually, but I'm not going to cave. And uh, I, you know, I, I worked Eastern Europe. The only place you could hear Václav Havel was on Voice of America. Uh, didn't mean Havel supported the Vietnam War or American Imperial, he was a socialist. Uh, but I'll take whatever platform I can get. I used to be at the epicenter of the American media empire. I used to write stories and the next day the State Department held briefings about it. And I've self-exiled myself because I won't play the game. You know I left the New York Times over, uh, I was publicly denouncing the call to invade Iraq and uh, I, was, uh, I was booed off of a commencement stage in Rockford, Illinois. At one point, most of the 1,000 people got up and started singing God Bless America to drown me out. They cut my microphone twice. Uh, they had two men in their gowns come up and try and push me off the podium. Um, that was my first and last commencement invitation. Uh, and so the Times gave me a written reprimand. I was the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. I spent seven years in the Middle East, and I speak Arabic. And they said, you're not allowed to speak about Iraq. And uh, because I was, in their words, impugning the impartiality of the New York Times. And I quit. 
I left the paper. Uh, I, will, I will go wherever I, I can speak, you know, what I have to speak. And uh, I'm certainly well aware that the Russian government, which certainly I don't have proof because it's technically another, a private company, but it's probably Russian money. I know why they're doing what they're doing in the same way that I knew why Voice of America was giving voice to all sorts of Eastern European dissidents. I was also working for a newspaper, the New York Times, that had blacklisted Noam Chomsky. They wouldn't even print his name in the paper, the intellectual I admire most in America. So uh, you have to carve out whatever uh, platform you can get and speak with the integrity, that, you know, as much integrity as you can, and realize, as Paul Tillich once wrote, that all institutions, including the church, are inherently demonic, and one day you're gonna run head on into that institution and have to walk away. That's kind of been my career. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's why I'm there, because I can't go anywhere else, uh, and because they will allow critics of imperialism and capitalism to have a voice, whereas our, our public broadcasting system, especially PBS, are wholly owned subsidiaries of the Koch brothers. You know they fund the news hour, right, on PBS? Yeah. I was up at the public radio station in Boston. David Koch sits on the board. That's why it's so boring. <laughs> uh, you go back to the late 1970s, you could, you could watch Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn. They were on public television. Because the role of a public broadcasting system is to give space and a platform to people who aren't owned. But we don't have one anymore, and NPR is awful. Okay. And I, I've got just a few more questions. Trevor Noah has said that Trump has weaponized victimhood. you have comments? Any comments on that? I, I don't think Trump's smart enough. <laughs> Trump, uh, all of this was preceded Trump. I mean, I was in Montgomery, Alabama with Brian Stevenson, the great civil rights attorney. We were walking through the streets of Montgomery, half of Montgomery's black, and Brian's pointing out these Confederate memorials everywhere. And then Brian says, you know, most of these were put up in the last 10 years. And that's what I saw in Yugoslavia. With the economic meltdown of Yugoslavia, the dispossession of the working class, they retreated into mythical identities because you lose work, you lose your capacity to have a voice within the society, then you retreat into a mythologized version of you and where you came from. And that feeds the sense of victimhood. You blame the other I mean, the whole idea that 11 or 12 million undocumented workers are responsible for the economic decline of the United States, it, it's about as, as rational as the idea that 800,000 Jews, which were about 1% of Germany, were responsible for the collapse of, it doesn't make any sense rationally, uh, but it's effective, and the elites always scapegoat, always demonize. Uh, and, and what I worry about, especially with the Trump administration, is that if we get, or when we get, to an economic crisis, um, just any sense of constraint will be lifted. So Trump is a classic demagogue. Remember that, you know, and you can read Evans or Kershaw, the great writers on Nazism. In 1928, the Nazis were considered buffoons. I mean, Hitler couldn't even speak proper German. I mean, they were just these weird characters. Uh, so 1929 comes, the, you have the economic crash, and then the control of the German government is in the hands of Ebert and the Social Democrats, the liberals. What does Ebert do? He caters to the international banking system. He imposes draconian forms of austerity, including abolishing unemployment insurance. And Kershaw, Evans, they all say, if without the economic collapse of Weimar, the Nazi party would have never achieved power. That was true in Yugoslavia. Because the anger at the system, especially if you get hyperinflation, the anger at the system becomes so pronounced that they will turn to people even though they realize these people are buffoonish. And you see that, that doesn't mean they're not very, very dangerous, as we see with Trump. But no, I think Trump is a, he's, he's, he's a con artist who 
uh, was astute enough to realize what people wanted to hear, 35% tariffs, I'll bring your jobs back, all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and, but he didn't weaponize. I mean, he, he that all, all, of this was, all of this groundwork was laid long before Trump. Trump, Trump is the product. He rises up out of this. this is, demagogues rise up out of this kind of disintegration. I've just got time for a couple more. In view of the shell game, you spoke a little bit ago about acting with integrity. And in view of the shell games that corporations play, do you have any advice on investing with integrity? I just thought I would pose it. Investing with integrity. Investing with integrity. Thinking about money. I, I, you know, I went to divinity school, not business school. Um, I, I really think that that's kind of, uh, how do I put it? Uh, that, yeah, it's an oxymoron, and it's uh, a classic way that capitalists engage in what we call uh, moral fragmentation, to quote uh, Svetan Dodorov, where uh, most of your lifestyle is geared towards building a pathetic little monument to yourself, and so you do things like ethical, what do you call it, ethical investing, uh, or, you know, you, you, you drop a bag of groceries off at the food kitchen or you engage in some r relatively meaningless act of philanthropy uh, and deny where most of your life is going. Um, look, most of America is really not sitting up at night thinking about investing. And I'm not either because I don't make that much money. Uh, can you say that you're, are you proud to be an American? Am I proud to be an American? I didn't write these questions, sir. Just to be I only read them. Well, you know, I spent 20 years outside of America. And when you spend that long outside of America, you're not American anymore. Um, the people that I love, and that's why I spoke about Jamal at the beginning, are those people who in every nation, out of every religion, out of every ethnicity, rose up to fight the oppressor on behalf of the oppressed. Um, and they are my brothers, and they are my sisters, and I don't really care what language they speak, and I don't care what color they are, and I don't care what country they come from. So you certainly touched on this, but I just want to give you more chance to sort of sum it all up. Um, since you refer to your own children, how do we give our children hope? Maybe how do you think about giving your children hope? You know, I don't share the culture's mania for hope. I don't. I've kind of, I find it kind of infantile. I covered war. Uh, you, you know, you, I mean, many of the people, including my closest friend, were killed in war. I, a lot of people I lost. You made a very cold calculation of the weapon systems arrayed against you, and you responded as rationally as you could. Um, uh, you know, hope is embodied, Vasily Grossman got it in his great novel, Life and Fate, uh, which you haven't read, you should go read, um, where he talks about uh, human kindness, um, that it's, it's not about a battle between good and evil, it's about a great evil uh, seeking to crush a kernel of human kindness, uh, but if that evil has not crushed human kindness by now, then evil can never win. Um, I... You know, I, we have such, I think because I've spent so much time around death, because I've lost so many people and they died young that I worked with, um, I, it, it's, I'm very cognizant of the very brief time that we have on this earth and how fragile it is. Evil will certainly outlive us all. Um, that it is our job uh, to stand up and uh, fight for what is just and what is right and what is good uh, and, and believe, as Berrigan said, um, that that good does draw to it the good, the invisible witnesses around us who I certainly carry. Um, I, uh, you know, I find hope by that class that I taught uh, with the 
on conquest, my best student, the only one who got an A+, plus, he was convicted of a crime he did not commit when he was 14 uh, and is not eligible to go before a parole board until he is 70 years old. <laughs> and he's 39 now. He w and he, you know, you, the bell goes, you gotta move in a prison or you get a charge. He waits till the classroom is empty and he says, uh, I know I'm gonna die in this prison, but I work as hard as I do because one day I'm gonna be a teacher like you. And he walks out. I can live on that for a really long time. That's hope. <laughs>